Welcome to Agape Ministries Podcasts, a whole new way of thinking. Episode 16, part one of Ruth Patterson's talk on community. My name is Teresa, and it is my privilege to welcome Reverend Dr. Ruth Patterson here with us this morning. You're very, very welcome. Kate Mila Falcher. And Ruth, on behalf of us gathered here this morning, we would like to offer you our deepest sympathy on the death of your mother. And we assure you of our prayers at this difficult time for you. So. Now I would like to share a few interesting facts about Ruth. And the first one is that in 1976, Ruth was the first woman to be ordained in Ireland. Can I say, Ruth, I remember it. I remember the papers. I remember it very, very well at the time. Uh, Ruth is a Presbyterian minister, and she is the director of Restoration Ministries. Now, you might be asking, what are Restoration Ministries? Well, this is a faith-driven organization that seeks to restore broken people and communities through prayer, listening, hospitality, and teaching. Then in 19, sorry, in 2003, Ruth was awarded an OBE for her work in reconciliation. So she's a woman of many talents and certainly a lot, a lot of work she has done around restoration. She's also written many books And her first book, I have it here, A Further Shore, she recounts her personal journey in prose and verse. It's available in the bookshop, and I would recommend it. If you want to know more about Ruth, I would certainly recommend that book. We now look forward, Ruth, to hearing what you have to share with us on community. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for your welcome and your accommodation of me today. To come bang into the middle of what must be three amazing days of rich sharing and inspiration feels a little bit like being a parenthesis, hopefully not an unnecessary one. It was a real privilege to to, to be asked to be part of what feels like such a vibrant gathering, and I must apologize for flitting in and out of something that I'd been looking forward to experiencing with you over these days. But I hope that what you are living together is fueling the hope within you that for all of us, the best is yet to be. For the past 23 years, as Teresa indicated, I have worked with Restoration Ministries. It's a non-denominational organization committed to healing, reconciliation, and peace. We take our name from the 23rd Psalm, He Restores My Soul. The extremely uh, confidential side of our work is to provide a safe place where people can come and tell their story and be heard, and be prayed for and with, if that is what they wish. The more public side is to provide, through our centre or further afield, opportunities for people to meet one another across the increasing number of divisions that constitute today's society, and to build relationships. In the simple, basic acceptance of a common humanity, 
and the conviction that when you get to know someone beyond the superficial, it's much more difficult to box them or to label them tidily away. I love words. Hopefully not the overuse of them, but to get beyond the superficial, to understand, that is, somehow to stand under them and to enter into the mystery of what they're seeking to convey. So when I read the word emerging in relation to this conference, I went to the dictionary, and this is what I found. To come into view as from concealment or obscurity. To come out of or to live through a difficult experience. To become apparent. And that really excited me. I come from the north of Ireland, where nearly 43 years ago, we embarked upon a nightmare journey that has been long in passing, largely because we were trailing behind us about 800 years of baggage overload. For people of my generation, that journey has shaped and molded most of our adult lives. Some have been stretched and challenged and envisioned. Others have simply battened down the hatches as their only perceived mode of survival. But we have now reached a point in the life of this island for which we give praise and thanks to God. In spite of, or maybe partly because, of our brokenness from the past, and our current economic vulnerabilities, something different is happening. That something was incarnated so movingly a few weeks ago when Mary greeted Elizabeth and the babe of a new Ireland leapt for joy in the womb of our long waiting. In the passing of Garrett the Good, we have been assured that even in today's world, pe people can still rise up and unequivocally attribute the word blessed to a politician. In the words of Brendan Gleeson at that wonderful College Green concert, we have been encouraged to stand up to breathe the air, to look around and see what friends we have. And we have been assured by one of the Moneygall Obamas <laughs> that our best days are still ahead. I believe that with all my heart, even though sometimes they may seem long in coming, maybe especially in the realm of official Christianity, Herman Hesse captures the mood, I think, when he writes, Now we are silent and sing no songs anymore. Our pace grows heavy. This was the night that was bound to come. Give me your hand. Perhaps we still have a long way to go. It's snowing. It's snowing. Winter is a hard thing in a strange country. When is the time when a light, a hearth burned for us? Give me your hand. Perhaps we still have a long way to go. We must never ever take the relative peace that we have been given in this island over the last few years for granted. It was and is a total miracle but we still have a long way to go in terms of accepting diversity as a gift from God, in dealing with the underlying sectarianism, racism, bitterness and fear that still control many of our attitudes. We are not yet a people who have been forged into one new body, not even in the church. Generically, the church is usually referred to as she. But recently, whenever I think of the institution, 
I have in my mind an image of a tired old man who, having once been in his prime, is now disillusioned, weary, and by and large devoid of hope. People aren't attracted to him anymore. In today's world, with so many different interests vying for people's attention, the church is often the butt of accusations of irrelevancy and hypocrisy, and more recently, even of betrayal. Not only do we bear the scandal of division, but also of so many other revelations that have marred our witness as image bearers of Jesus. It's a time when our pace on the journey is heavy. The songs are silent, and we find ourselves in the strange country of rejection and seeming exile. It has seemed like winter, with little hint of spring or resurrection. We don't know when last there was a light or a fire burning for us or within us. We've been like the two friends on the first stages of their journey to Emmaus, devoid of hope, lacking awareness, trapped in two-dimensional living. Also, as Christians of whatever persuasion, we are still locked into single identity community embedded in generations of denominational concrete. John O'Donoghue has written a blessing for love in a time of conflict. And he says this, when the gentleness between you hardens and you fall out of your belonging with each other, may the depths you have reached hold you still. Now is the time for you to be gracious, to allow a kindness beyond thought and hurt. Reach out with sure hands to take the chalice of your love and carry it carefully through this echoless waste until this winter pilgrimage leads you towards the gateway to spring. We have been through an echoless waste, waste, but now we need each other. Not only those of us who live in different parts of this island, but especially all of us in the different branches of the Christian church. We have always needed each other. Over hundreds of years, the gentleness between us has hardened. And who can even remember truly when we fell out of belonging with each other? I would want to make a statement of faith today that the depths we have reached can even yet be used in a redemptive way to hold us in that place of hope. In our brokenness, we are being called, I believe, to stand or kneel together. Now is the time for us to be gracious. Now is the time to declare that we are living in a new day. Now is the time to reach out with sure hands and to take the chalice of that love that underpins everything, that love that unites us, the love we know in Jesus, and carry it carefully through this fragile time as prisoners of hope who know that they are being led towards the gateway to spring, to resurrection, to the fulfillment of our destiny as children of God, who happen to have been born in Ireland, and who, because of that, can now be bearers of hope to the world. And where does the key lie? It lies, I believe, in what the struggling Algerian church calls the sacrament of encounter. It lies in community. In terms of our definition of emerging, something is coming through from years of concealment and obscurity. We have lived through, to say the least, a difficult experience. And what is becoming apparent is a desperate hunger for meaning and belonging, for relationship. It is being said with increasing frequency 
that what will eventually characterize 21st century Christianity will be small communities of those who, to use the dictionary definition of community, hold certain attitudes and interests in common, albeit expressed in many different ways. What is emerging, although perhaps still largely in the unseen world, but only a threshold step away, is the sense of our interdependence, the riches that we have to share with each other as part of the wonderfully diverse family of God, the sense of belonging and identity that is safe but not confining, that embraces but does not stifle, that draws people into an ambiance that is nurturing and empowering in order to propel them outwards with confidence. The concept of community has been part of my life for longer than I can remember. It was fed and nurtured by some wonderful people and movements of faith and vision. I think of the Iona community in Scotland, the Teze community in France, the Agape community in Italy, and many more, all having an influence far beyond their national boundaries. And of course, much closer to home, the Corrymeela community in Ireland. Years ago, while studying community development in Toronto, I came across a statement from the American philosopher Josiah Royce. And it has remained with me throughout all the years as both an encouragement and an aspiration. He said this, I believe in the beloved community and in the spirit that makes it beloved and in the communion of all who are in will and in deed its members. I see no such community as yet. Nonetheless, my rule of life is act so as to hasten its coming. That is what has motivated us in Restoration Ministries over the last 23 years. In the natural, what I sometimes call the two-dimensional level, our attitudes and interests vary greatly. And some of them become so fixed within us that they become sources of conflict and division, even war. But as people of faith, we don't live solely in two dimensions. There is a third dimension. Some call it the supernatural. Others, myself included, refer to it as the kingdom that is all about us and within us. Paradoxically, it is here right now, but is still to come in all its fullness. But it is closer than we realize, a bit like Narnia. It's just that our level of awareness has become so dull and almost non-existent over the years. In that kingdom, we are not called to be all the same. That's not what having all things in common means, not what the beloved community means. Rather, it is a celebration of all the wonderful diversity that is part of creation and a unity in that diversity. And it's possible, it's possible when people begin to know themselves as beloved. When that happens, they no longer have to prove a point or take a legalistic or fundamentalist stand against all comers who don't think and act the way they do. They are free, free because they know that they are loved just as they are. They become radicals in the real sense of that term, going back to their roots, back to Jesus. Increasingly, their lives take on the characteristics of the kingdom, which could be summed up in the Beatitudes. And the word Beatitude, if you break it down, really means, let this be your attitude. Mercy, humility, purity of heart, a hunger for justice, a maker of peace, and a willingness to pay the price to see right prevail. If our roots go deep, 
down into God, drawing our nourishment from him, then we become his image bearers and others will begin to hunger and to thirst for that life as well. That's the way the early believers lived. They met together, shared everything they had, sold their possessions to help those in need, worshipped together, met in each other's homes for the Eucharist, shared meals with great joy and generosity, all the time praising God. And people round about responded. At the end of Acts chapter 2, there's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. And each day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Why did the people round about respond and join them? It wasn't because they were being preached at or giving li given lists of rules and regulations. It was because they saw changed lives. Those early Christians had an open secret that they, wa that they wanted as well. The first believers were called people of the way. In other words, they were on a journey. They hadn't arrived. They didn't know it all. They were in the process of being saved. They were pilgrims in the process of becoming all that God intended them to be as citizens of the kingdom. According to the dictionary definition, the pilgrim is one who journeys to a shrine or a holy place. But there is another derivation of the word that suggests that pilgrim has its roots in the Latin per agrum, through the field. Phil Cousineau in The Art of Pilgrimage says, This ancient image suggests a curious soul who walks beyond known boundaries, crosses fields, touching the earth, with a destination in mind and a purpose in heart. That's who we are. And that, for me, is what makes the Christian journey so exciting. There's always more. We're a traveling people. And if anyone ever says to you that they've arrived, beware. The biggest witness is not dogma or doctrine, but a changing life. I wouldn't even so much say a changed life as a changing life in the process of becoming. When I first really heard the word beloved, the reason it stuck with me was because it wasn't just spoken into my mind, but into my heart. It was also spoken by a person who was living it. And over the years, it has taken on a deeper and deeper meaning for me. It is not just a description, although that description is true and beautiful and stands in its own right. I am, you are, beloved. That's the truth of who we are, even if we don't know it. And so many people in this island and around the world don't know it, which is one of the major reasons why there's so much conflict and oppression and injustice and absence of peace. You'd be amazed, or maybe you wouldn't, at the number of people, probably even in this room this morning, who don't even like themselves, or maybe actively hate who they are. Their, the concept of being beloved is totally foreign to them, and yet it is a vital key in the creation of community. And I'm coming to see that perhaps it is the most radical gospel call of all. You see, beloved just isn't a description or an adjective. If you break the word down, it's also a command. Be loved. It's a challenge, even a vocation, to choose to accept the fact. The fact that I am that you are created in the image and likeness of God and what God makes, he loves unconditionally and forever. The barriers, the obstacles are from our side. Our own feelings of inadequacy or rejection or fear or resentment or anguish or whatever. We may feel that what life has dealt us is so negative 
the sense of worthlessness so strong that belovedness doesn't even feature on our radar screen. Jean Vanier says in one of his recent letters, within our societies based on rivalry, we are often afraid to show our weakness. Admitting weakness can be dangerous since it might lead to rejection. Instead, we feel that we need to show our competence, our capability, our power, our knowledge. If not, we risk being wounded, rejected, isolated, and scorned. What if we dared to believe that being loved is within our grasp, that all we have to do is to choose to believe it? And as we practice that choice, a bit like building up our muscles after an injury, one day we'll be aware that this truth has taken root within us, has become part of us, we will then be well on our way towards being builders of community and makers of peace. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. We pray that this teaching will help you become more like Jesus and in your generation and in your locality be someone who speaks of reconciliation and the movement from conflict to community. So tune in next week for part two of Ruth Patterson's talk on community. So until we meet again, God bless you and stay safe.